Thank you. You made my job easier, uh, dear chairpersons. Thank, thank you for having me here, Dr. Banshi and team Diakir Khan. Multiple conversations since yesterday on different aspects of managing diabetes. So I'm glad that I'm speaking on something that we all agree on, which is that we are a carb-eating nation and how our approach in patients with diabetes should be a little different. So diabetes in South Asians, let's agree that our phenotype is different. You keep hearing about the thin fat Indian. We have more insulin resistance and yet hyperinsulinemia. We have lower levels of adiponectin. We have higher levels of inflammation and C-reactive protein. We also have higher beta cell dysfunction, marked deficit in the first phase of insulin release. And the fact is our patients with diabetes are getting detected much earlier and landing up with complications at a younger age. So there is need for more individualized and ethnic specific management of type 2 diabetes. It can't be one size fits all. The real culprit for uncontrolled hyperglycemia, evidence from Shashank's starch study, that across the country, it's not that what we would have thought it's only in the south of India or certain parts or Gujarat eats more. No, everybody is anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of carbs across India. And most of us love our carbs. And which is why our patients land up having diets which are rich in carbohydrate and show usual spikes. So even if you start seeing in individuals with pre-diabetes, you will start noticing the spikes in the CGM values which are coming in only in the postprandial meal. And that's why when your patients or their relatives are screening, very often they will say, the doctor, I was always looking at my sugars, they were normal. Suddenly this time I have been detected. But what were you looking at? I was looking at my fasting sugar. So every year I do my fasting sugar once, and that gives me a false sense of satisfaction that I am non-diabetic. Always insist in our scenario that somebody is screening. If you're not doing an OGTT, or an HbA1c, at least do a fasting and two hours postprandial. That's going to be important. And as clearly we see that Asian type 2 diabetes patients have an insulin secretion deficiency, especially in the early phase. There is this data comparing the Caucasian population versus Japanese, and we can see that the insulogenic index is, is lower in the Asian population. Asians genetically differ from Western. This is interesting. The same food, when eaten by different populations, will have a different response in the body. You're talking about a sweet meal biscuit and you're looking at Asian Indians versus UK Caucasian, the rise in sugar. Again, sweet biscuit, we react more adversely. Malted wheat, cereal, cereal biscuit with milk. So the entire British habit of tea and cookies is, is good for them. It's not good for us. The biscuits and the cookies are really dangerous. In fact, again, all of you who are looking at doing CGMs in your patients, you'll realize that by the time your patient is getting into the breakfast mode at 9 o'clock or 9.30, after that, so, uh, that, that cup of tea and two digestive or Mari biscuits, which we thought were innocent, is actually pushing the sugars up to almost 180 before they're getting into the breakfast mode. So very often, in fact, after seeing CGMs, we ask patients to start taking drugs, especially something like a alpha glucosidase inhibitor or something else, with their tea and biscuit, or sometimes even in the evening snack, because that's preventing the rise of sugars before they go into the actual meal phase. Greater contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia. All of us are aware about the original Monnier study that how much postprandial and how much fasting contributes at different levels of HbA1c. To the right is the, the Wang data, which showed that when it comes to the Asian population, the contribution of postprandial is not only when the A1c is getting less than 8. At all levels of HbA1c in the Indian population or Asian population, postprandial sugars are always contributing high. Hence, in our population, looking at postprandial and means to reduce postprandial will always be important. Is postprandial hyperglycemia an independent risk factor for macrovascular complications? Well, huge data. And you can see right from uh, the DECODE studies to various Japanese and other Asian studies to the recommendations by the IDF, Multiple data showing that postprandial hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular risk. The fact that today patients with IGT are known to have higher chance of macrovascular complications than a normal glucose tolerant individual also itself has been evidence that postprandial is an independent risk factor or PP hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular risk. So does controlling postprandial sugar reduce the cardiovascular disease risk factors? Well, yes. So just saying 
the postprandial is, is a cardiovascular risk factor, we should have evidence to the contrary also in terms of reducing postprandial, will it reduce our, our CVD risk? And clearly it has shown that it results in reduction in total cholesterol triglycerides, reduction in blood pressure and hypercoagulability and inflammatory factor just by reducing your postprandial sugars and it slows the progression of carotid intimal medial thickness, even partially reverses it purely by controlling your postprandial sugars. So we come to the drug on focus, which I mentioned is alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, the AGIs delay the absorption of carbohydrates and reduce postprandial hyperglycemia. Many are aware of this. It's not a new drug. A carbos, glucobe, we've been using it for a while. Primarily suitable to Indian diabetes patients or Asian patients, if I can say, and it has 25 years of rich experience and huge scientific evidence. 600 plus clinical trials, 2000 published data, studied in over 70,000 patients worldwide and proven safety and efficacy in more than 45,000 Asian or Indian patients. What's important is to remember that prevention is better than cure. A carbos primarily takes care of postprandial levels. It's not trying to have large claims. Nobody from A carbos says that it's controlling fasting sugar also. No, it's purely for your postprandial glycemic spike. It slows down the carbohydrate absorption from the small intestine and you can clearly see that without A carbos, you're seeing the spike in sugar. With A carbos, the carbs are getting pushed to the lower intestine. So it's getting down towards the ileum as well. And you're seeing that spike getting interspread or spread over a larger time and distance and distance in the gut and time after meal. So A carbos delays intestinal carbohydrate absorptions, lowers post meal hyperglycemia. Importantly, because of this aspect leads to lesser insulin need landing up in preserving and protecting the beta cells. Also improves insulin sensitivity. What's now interesting is the carbohydrates reaching the lower part of the intestine, they actually facilitate the GLP-1 release and they have their independent GLP-1 effect. So a carbose reduces postprandial glucose and hence reduces the postprandial insulin requirement, has an insulin sparing mechanism. So to the left you can see as compared to placebo when you use a carbose, you are able to see a reduction in the postprandial glycemic spike. This reduction in PP, all insulin levels with a carbose as well. So less spike but importantly insulin sparing effect as compared to using a sulfonylurea or a repaglinide which will reduce the spike. Right? So very often when we'll ask you what do you use for postprandial, you'll say it's either a AGI or a repaglinide or the glinides. But there's a difference. A carbose has insulin sparing effect. Your glinides are going to act on the pancreatic beta cells and cause release of insulin. So it's not the same thing at all. So insulin sparing mechanism of action translates into clinical benefits. And here we can see these benefits. So in a clear meta-analysis, you're able to appreciate the, the, uh, the impact on body weight. Of course, GLP ones would be the best, but look at as compared to all the other drugs, pretty much weight neutral, and one may say to some extent evidence also showing weight loss. And here again, we are looking at hypoglycemia, and you'll find it in amongst the safest of drugs not causing hypoglycemia. So A-carbos enhances GLP-1 secretion in small intestine. We can see what's happening without the A-carbos. Carbs going down and getting largely absorbed in the upper part of the small intestine. Here with A carbose, it slows down the degradation from the, um, uh, from the complex carbohydrates to the simple carbohydrate and hence you're seeing the carbs reaching the lower part of the ileum, the L cells, causing release of GLP, which is seen in this evidence also as compared to control. When you're using A carbose, GLP-1 is going up. So metformin causes GLP-1 release. DPP-4 inhibitors cause some GLP uh, uh, protection. And of course, drugs like A carbos are also helping us through GLP release. So A carbos as an add-on to DPP-4 inhibitor, well, it's not, need not be either or. Today you have evidence that patients who are using, and here you're seeing patients on allogleptin plus allogleptin and A carbos. Plasma glucose much better when you're using a DPP-4 and an A carbos. And similarly, the active GLP-1 release is also higher when you're using a DPP-4 and A carbose there. What about its efficacy? Well, most of us would have had the perception AGIs, very, very mild and weak, right? We, we often use the word weak uh, agents. Well, are they really weak agents? 
what is the evidence for most of the new drugs? It's somewhere between 0.6 to 0.8 percent from a baseline HbA1c of 8 percent. When you look at the data for most of the drugs, barring a sulfonylurea or insulin, you'll get a reduction of 0.6 to 0.8 percent. And here we are seeing mean change in A1c by 0.8 percent with purely A carbose monotherapy, good reduction in, in the fasting and postprandial levels. Meta-analysis showing that A1C reduction with A-carbose in Eastern diet population, so is, is, is in fact more. So when you eat a Western diet, well, which has very less carbs and more of protein and fat, probably A-carbose is not the best choice for them. But the moment you're talking about Eastern diet, the Indian, the Chinese, the Japanese, the, the entire population, what we eat here, the response to A1C reduction is much higher. And which is why you heard Dr. Akash Singh speak so beautifully about DPP-4 inhibitors and, and specifics of DPP-4 in, in the Indian Asian population. So different drugs have a different response in different um, races and different population. So clearly in the Eastern diet population, you see A1C is coming down to the tune of 1.4%. Acarbrose also improves glucose control. This is from the multinational gluco VIP multinational real world evidence study, which had an Indian arm itself. Um, what they saw in the Indian sub analysis, we can clearly see the reduction in sugars. You're looking at the mean postprandial glucose coming down from 243 to 169. Of course, it has an impact indirectly on the fasting also. 158 to 120, which is more of an indirect effect. More than 80% received less than 150 milligram, and which is fine, and to see that from real world evidence, because many of us may feel our patients may not tolerate 50 milligram TDS. You know, in the beginning when it came, we were told to use up to 100 milligram TDS. I don't think many of us landed up using. The average usage is 50 TDS or BD at times, and it's showing that those patients did well. Mean reduction from baseline was 1% after 12 and a half weeks itself and significant change in fasting and postprandial. What about comparison of therapeutic effects of A-carbose and metformin under different beta cell function status? Very interesting uh, data and study. Irrespective of the kind of beta cell function, right? good, medium or poor beta cell function, you can see A1C again being similar. So irrespective, this is not dependent on your beta cell secretory capacity. That means a carbose will work in getting the A1C down in the beginning of the life of a person with diabetes or even after 15 years. Even if the beta cells have failed, he's still going to, he or she is still going to eat carbs and you'll get efficacy from A1C coming even at that point in time. You're looking at uh, a review article of comparative effectiveness of glucose-lowering drugs for type 2 diabetes. Now. The at the first glance, you will see what is wondering, what, what am I showing? At both the places, you think that alpha glucose inhibitors are at the bottom of the chart. But look at the change in A1C levels in drug naive patients. It's about 0.73. But look around. It's, as I said, between 0.6 to 0.8. In some of the analysis, it has shown DPP-4s as weaker, causing only 0.6, and A-carbos causing 0.73, and change in A1C in patients receiving metformin-based Therapy already on the top of metformin, you're getting an additional 0.5, which is pretty similar to most of the other drugs that we are using. So barring insulin, most of them are going to cause a 0.5 to 0.7. So that perception that this is a weak agent is truly wrong because the contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia in Indians and Asians is not weak. There's huge contribution of postprandial, and hence the A1C reduction through A carbose is significant. So a carbose increases reversion to normal glucose tolerance and delays risk of progression to diabetes. Stop NIDDM was a large prevention trial from looking at what's happening to patients with pre-diabetes. And it showed great reduction in the incidence of development of type 2 diabetes by using a carbose, which remains as one of the drugs approved for use in patients with pre-diabetes. GLOBE was a study looking at the use of a carbose and metformin, which was Glucobay-M. Observation study for efficacy and safety in treatment of Indian type 2 patients. Dr. Banshi Sabu was the lead author for this study, and many of us from different centers were happy to be a part of it. What did it show us in the Indian data? Mean change in PPG from initial visit to last visit was about 80 milligram person. Up to 2.8 percent A1C reduction with A carbose metformin fixed dose combination. So many of us prefer to use a glucobay M, maybe BD 
right from the beginning for drug naive patients to get this reduction and great efficacy, especially in drug naive patients. And hence, today you look at the RSSDI ESI recommendations. You also look at what IDF is saying and the Chinese and the Japanese societies are saying they will place AGIs as one of the therapeutic options. Of course, when you look at China, it keeps it right up there. Maximum usage because of their maximum consumption of carbs and rice, AGIs become their preferred choice. Quickly, let me show you evidence for these four aspects, glycemic variability. Why GV is even more significant from Indian patients' perspective? Because postprandial hyperglycemia is the largest contributor to glucose variability. You heard conversations on CGM and picking up GV. Even the RSSDI 2020 recommendations talks about ACARBOS contributing to GV reduction. So glycemic variability reduction happens significantly by ACARBOS. Significant higher reduction of the metrics of glycemic variability. We are looking at coefficient of variation. We are looking at MAGE and you're looking at standard deviation. As compared to metformin, ACARBOS is causing improvement in all the metrics of glycemic variability. Also, addition of ACARBOS to metformin and vildagliptin further control the type 2 patients and decrease the intraday glycemic variability. And we can see the improvement in, in the TIR metrics. So when you're using metformin and vildagliptin and placebo, the time above range was 31%. The moment A carbose came in, the time above range dropped to 8%. So clearly better for improving the metrics. Also data on reduction of MI and all-cause death in type 2 diabetes during a 10-year multifactorial intervention study. This was the Beijing Community Diabetes Study. What it showed was compared with A carbose free therapy, those who were on A carbose had a lower incidence of MI events. 1.78% versus 3.57 in the control group, and all-cause death was reduced 6.16, almost half as compared to the control group. So that was the benefit offered by metformin. Significantly lower risk of this ACARBOS metformin for hospitalization due to stroke, atherosclerotic, and MI events compared with an SU metformin. So direct comparison between SU and, and, the, and, and the ACARBOS aspect showing ACARBOS to be far safer and almost 30% reduction in any of these endpoints. ACARB was also found to reduce weight. Does it claim to be a weight loss drug? No. But evidence showing in data that about 1.45 plus minus 3 to 4% could be the weight loss purely by ACARBOS. Finally, gut microbiota, extremely important we understand today. And AGIs, amongst the, all the alpha glucosidase, ACARBOS is the only one which allows polysaccharides to reach the large intestine. In the other ones, it is not polysaccharides, but it is only the oligosaccharides which are reaching, and hence ACARBOS is different from Voglibose and, and Miglitol, which was available earlier. It brings about changes in the gut microbiota, essentially looking at abundance of five genera of, of, of bacillus there, lactobacillus and diallister, the gut symbionts is increased by the use of ACARBOS, and I'm sure all of us understand today the importance of the gut microbiome. So let me conclude, Chairperson, sir. The START study showed that we are a carb-eating nation. Increased postprandial glycemia is associated with endothelial dysfunction and oxidative stress, which is a strong predictor of cardiovascular disease. ACARBOS is approved in patients with IGT, among the few drugs improved in patients with pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and also and for type 1 as, of course, an add-on therapy only to look at postprandial peaks. Of course, you'll use your insulins for patients with type 1. Reduces PPG, low risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. More effective in the Asian diet. Reduces glycemic variability by reducing the postprandial spike. Also evidence for reduction in CVD risk factors. Somewhat benefits in weight in selective patients. The only AGI which is allowing the polysaccharides to reach down, so it's different from the other AGIs, and we need to appreciate that. And more recent evidence showing promising effect of ACARBOS in animal st studies owing to its metabolic benefits and, of course, the benefits on gut microbiome. With that, I thank you for having me here and happy to take any questions.